Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, any cardiologists in the audience? No. Uh, so as the token, uh, token cardiologist, uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, give you the perspective of how we would see these patients being managed, taking into account what Kareem told you about high quality support for 30 days, increasing the chances of recovery, and secondly, the need to initiate uh, that support early on. So uh, we, we certainly have in the, in the cardiology practice a need for short-term hemodynamic support. It includes these patients with acute MIs and cardiogenic shocks. Uh, and it also includes uh, uh, patients with perioperative heart failure, cardiomyopathy, and prophylactic support for high-risk interventions. It's estimated uh, that there are about 100 or 150,000 cases per year for shock and an additional 100,000 for high-risk interventions. The options that we have available to us are not very satisfactory. The inotropes have limited potency and arrhythmic potential as well as perfusion issues for the vasoconstrictors. The vasodilators are not usable in most shock patients with baseline hypotension. And we now have a family of uh, percutaneous uh, or limited uh, invasive circulatory support devices. Uh, the king among those is the intraortic balloon pump. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, CPS or ECMO. Um, have been used uh, with uh, limited durability, limited durations of support. We always have the option of calling uh, you, our surgical colleagues, for implantation of a VAD, uh, but then there are some new catheter-based systems, the Tandem Heart, uh, the Yomed Retan uh, device, uh, AMED Hemopump, and Impella. I'll just talk a little bit about about those. As we look at those hemodynamic support devices, the things that are most important to us are uh, the ability to get rapid access uh, to the device and to place it uh, in the cath lab. Um, if the patient has to go to the operating room, it, it adds additional delay. Second uh, desirable feature is hemodynamic uh, efficacy. Um, and we really know that we need from the uh, LVAD uh, literature, the ability to pump two to four liters per minute, uh, and to show that we're reducing filling pressures while maintaining arterial pressure, uh, also decreasing myocardial oxygen consumption and improving the supply demand ratio. At the same time, safety is paramount. Uh, we'd like to avoid limb ischemia at the arterial site uh, and have a simple device that does not, if possible, use an external blood circuit. Uh, we'd like a device that uh, could dwell for at least several hours or maybe as much uh, as a couple of days without hemolysis, thrombosis, or infection. And we'd like the exit path in terms of weaning and removal, um, either at recovery or at the time of transition to the next intermediate or long-term hemodynamic support device to be relatively benign. So I think the paradigm that's developing is that to maintain the circulation and allow time for recovery, we really need a range of potent hemodynamic support devices, some that can be put in promptly by cardiologists in the cath lab, uh, and then others where we can transition to potent longer-term devices placed in the operating room to protect end organs and allow enough time for myocardial recovery, which may be up to 30 days. Uh, so uh, really, we've, uh, in the uh, acute uh, device, uh, uh, area in hours to days, the balloon pump has been the only uh, device that we've had. Um, and if one possibility to improve support and recovery would be earlier transition of shock patients uh, from uh, cardiology settings to cardiac surgery for early implantation of uh, VAD devices. And that uh, may be uh, quite effective and is being done in some centers. But the other path that I'd like to talk about in the next uh, few minutes uh, is the concept that uh, uh, cardiology might have access to new technologies that supplant the balloon pump uh, in providing greater hemodynamic efficacy. Well, I mean, the balloon pump has uh, been around for 35 years, and now it's uh, quite benign to insert. Uh, with percutaneous over-the-wire devices now down to seven and a half French. Uh, good diastolic augmentation and systolic unloading 
but really modest increases in cardiac in, uh, index and modest decreases in wedge pressure uh, that somewhat improves uh, coronary supply demand ratio, but with no uh, clear benefit on mortality in any of these uh, shock studies. Uh, some of the more potent devices uh, that are available include uh, cardiac assist tandem heart, uh, which removes oxygenated blood from the left atrium via a large transeptal cannula, uh, 21 French inflow, and uh, 12 to 17 percent, uh, 12 17 French outflow uh, that lets this device uh, pump two and a half to three and a half liters per minute. There are a little bit more than 100 patients in trials for about three days. Uh, but still the survival to discharge with cardiogenic shock uh, is only about 43%. I think the main issues for rapid adoption of this device uh, are that the uh, transeptal puncture and the large dilators, uh, as well as the arterial perfusion cannula, uh, make this a, a more daunting procedure, and it does require um, a perfusionist, uh, given the uh, high volume uh, flow uh, outside the body. Another device uh, that uh, has been used uh, for support is the Impella system, uh, and this is a system that uses a uh, cannula with a motor uh, and an Archimedes screw that uh, suctions blood out of the left ventricle as the tip of the cannula sits in the left ventricle, I'll show you that in a second, uh, and exits the catheter in the ascending aorta. Uh, so functioning in parallel with the left ventricle uh, to circulate blood. There are two different systems that have been tested. Uh, there's a 20 French uh, surgically implantable system that uh, can generate flows of five liters uh, and a 12 French percutaneously implantable system that can generate flows of two and a half liters. Now what is the uh, position of that catheter? Here you see the uh, pigtail at the end of this catheter. Here is the uh, inflow to the cannula sitting in the left ventricle, and then the motor and impeller sit in the ascending aorta so that it creates a path for blood to be sucked from the left ventricle and expelled into the ascending aorta. Uh, this shows the position uh, relative to the aortic valve plane uh, in uh, correct uh, positioning. That's been compared to intraaortic balloon pump in animal models. This is a, uh, a calf model of severe mitral regurgitation uh, uh, from Dr. Van Omen in Maastricht. Uh, and what it shows is that the Impella device at uh, full uh, function is much more potent at increasing cardiac output, um, in increasing aortic pressure, uh, carotid flow, um, and interestingly uh, is much more potent at decreasing left ventricular work. Uh, so uh, the fact that the diastolic coronary flow uh, increase is slightly less than seen with the balloon pump is really a reflection of autoregulation and the fact that there's such a dramatic uh, decrease in LV work and uh, myocardial oxygen demand. Uh, the uh, effect on uh, ventricular mechanics is evident in uh, this slide showing uh, off and on uh, left ventricular pressure volume loops uh, with balloon pumping uh, and with uh, impella uh, pumping, uh, showing the extent to which the left ventricle is unloaded and myocardial oxygen consumption is reduced. In fact, in animal models of ongoing uh, LAD occlusion, uh, without uh, such offloading and with offloading seen on the right, uh, there's a dramatic reduction in the amount of myocardial necrosis as a percentage of the area at risk uh, with left ventricular unloading. So I think where we're headed uh, with this concept and building on uh, what Kareem presented is that to improve myocardial recovery and outcome, we really need two things. First, we need to encourage cardiologists to move earlier to potent surgically implanted support uh, VAS like the AB5000 and be prepared to leave them in place for up to 30 days to allow uh, for a maximal chance of myocardial recovery. And at the same time, uh, we need to develop more potent minimally invasive support devices like the two that I've shown you uh, that can be placed earlier in the evolution of cardiogenic shock, uh, maybe within the first hour or two uh, when those patients are invariably in the cath lab for primary angioplasty. 
uh, and can provide this high level of hemodynamic support to maintain end organ function while they reduce myocardial oxygen consumption uh, and hopefully allow some areas at risk to decide that it's better to live than die. Uh, and then stabilize the patient for long enough uh, that, uh, that they can go to a surgical procedure for implantation of uh, a ventricular assist device that can provide a longer period of hemodynamic support for recovery. Thank you.